Honorable Ken Cuccinelli's remarks, and uh, we're blessed to have him here. Um, like I said, Will Walder and Divine Mercy Care. I came on a little over two years ago as executive director, and I'm very blessed to be able to to work for this mission. Uh, what we do every day, both at Divine Mercy Care, uh, and inspire and educate life-affirming medicine uh, within our programs of outreach, like this one, Aslan's Army, which is really outreach into the parishes and working with volunteers like Shannon Branley and Sherry Sherrier. We're really blessed to have this facility here at St. Veronica's and the support for Father Kleiman. So um, hats off to all of our volunteers and to Father Kleiman for allowing us to use this space. Um, the third aspect of what we do is really the pro-women's health care centers. And this is a consortium of, of women's centers similar to Tepeyac that are around the country that, again, adhere to a standard of life-affirming medicine. And this is vitally important because what we hear from the, the opposition is that there is not good medicine for women out there if funding is taken away from Planned Parenthood. Well, pro-women's health care centers is the answer to that because it's real health care. For, for women, and uh, I encourage you to take some of our, our brochures to, to understand, uh, to visit our webpage to really get a better understanding of, of what those pro-women's health care centers are really about and where we're going. Um, the other thing I want to let everyone know is November 10th. It's our gala. It's our largest uh, fundraiser of the year, and it is run, uh, we're fortunate to have Monique Baruti, who's been a long time um, supporter and gala member and uh, a chair this year for the second year and uh, we're really looking forward. It's, it's in great shape uh, to burst through the doors and have an even better event than we've had in the past. So, uh, so if you have the opportunity to go to that, it's a great rallying point and enthusiastic time and great chance to celebrate. The other thing I want to let you all know is uh, next year, believe it or not, it's the 25th year of Tepeyac OBGYN. And it really looks, and it's, it's amazing to think about that uh, for some of you that have known about it for so many years, who've been supporting us both spiritually, financially, uh, and with your time. It is, it is, it's an amazing scenario. Uh, my wife and I have had eight of our, our, seven of our eight children have been through the practice, and we're, and before we were married, my wife as a single person was going to Dr. Bachowski. So we've had this relationship for a number of years, and it's just. It's a wonderful thing to kind of sit back and observe 25 years. It's really remarkable. But keep an eye on the different things we're going to have coming up. We'll have a lecture series. Uh, we're going to have a couple of publications, history of, of Tepeyac and the different things that have happened along the way, the different uh, providers, the, employ the different employees and pivotal people that have, that have helped make it what it is today. In addition to uh, a little, little sneak preview that we are working on a, a biography with Dr. John Bachowski and really telling his story. So, um, so keep an eye on that as it comes forward. But um, I just want to really thank all of you again for coming and uh, really uh, kind of give a little background on the Honorable uh, Ken Cuccinelli II. Uh, just turned 50 this past July. I'm sure he's excited for me to tell you all that. <laughs> but more importantly, last December, uh, he became a grandfather. And uh, probably one of his more, more proudest moments, I'm sure, in addition to his seven children, uh, of which his, his five youngest were born through the practice at Tepeyac. And uh, we're really fortunate to have him. He is, as many of you may know, he's a former attorney general of uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, is a statesman uh, within our uh, state government, and a proud graduate of both uh, the University of Virginia and George Mason University Law Center, as well as uh, an, an additional degree, I didn't know about this, in commercial policy and international um, uh, business. So we're uh, really blessed to have him here and, and supporting us. I think it's a neat time in history. I'm blessed to have my daughter here kind of taking pictures to be able to see what's happening right now within the Supreme Court justices. And, uh, and, and it's a pivotal point. And for those of us that are really kind of been into this pro-life movement and really wanting to find some light at the end of the tunnel. And not that, uh, not that Judge, you know, Judge Kavanaugh, if he's, if he's duly uh, appointed uh, to the Supreme Court, will be that, that pivotal person. But we, we all have hope. And I think um, the Honorable Kuchinelli's uh, message here will be, 
will be one that's uh, enlightening to me for sure, but I also think it's it all educational too at the same time and letting us know that it's you know, a little teaser. It's, it's not always really about the law. It's really about one, one woman at a time and taking care of her. And I think that's really a great point. Uh, it's what we try to do every day at Tepiak, and it's really what we try to do at Divine Mercy Care. So without any more delays, tend to you know, thank you. But uh, it is a pleasure to be here back at St. Veronica's. Been to church here many times. Um, when we lived in Centerville, I uh, see plenty of friends here um, uh, from years past, and, and appreciate you all coming for this talk. I, we're going to talk about Judge Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court and where the pro-life movement is now in the political and legal arena. But it's important to remember when you leave here that we're going to, you've all seen the bumper sticker, think globally, act locally. We're going to talk about the global situation. But this is how you act locally. Um, and this is how we see local action on this issue in our community. And through our churches, um, it's great to have St. Veronica's as a partner with DMC. Um, so I, I don't want you uh, to forget that. Um, I hope you're interested in the subject matter that I'm going to talk about. But when it comes to actually moving the ball forward, actually affecting the battle for life, I hope you'll remember this is how you do it. It truly is a battle that isn't going to be won or lost in the law or in politics, but in the hearts and minds of individual Americans. And, and for America, I believe that we are the best opportunity the world has to see a good example. And if we don't lead in the right direction on this issue, um, it's not reasonable of us to expect to see others in the world going in the direction we'd like to see them go when it comes to protecting life and families. So we, as a nation, in my view, bear a bigger responsibility than just occupying our 5% of the landmass. Um, we are viewed as a leader. So with that in mind, let's talk about where we are. We're in the middle of the process of the Senate uh, considering uh, confirming President Trump's nomination of Judge Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court to become Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, to replace Justice Kennedy on the Supreme Court and what that means for the pro-life movement. First of all, we can't be definite about what it means um, really until after cases are decided. Uh, we've had high hopes for other justices before and strangely enough, our high hopes are always the ones that are dashed. Um, the, the Democrat nominees to the court move left and the Republican nominees to the court move left. Uh, we don't see a lot of judges who are nominated, get on the Supreme Court, and then move to the right. I can't name one off the top of my head. Some of the biggest battles you've seen in the last 31 years, and I say 31 years because 31 years ago was Judge Bork. And for those of you too young to remember, Judge Bork's nomination was where the nomination process turned truly ugly and partisan. Uh, and to a lesser extent, ideological. Um, ideological to me is not a bad thing. Ideological is a good thing. It suggests you have to believe something uh, to even talk about an ideology. And um, unfortunately, there is a substantial difference between the types of nominees we see over the years come forward. Um, the reason you're seeing the hysteria, which has been the most noteworthy aspect of Judge Kavanaugh's hearings, has just been the hysteria, um, is because the left use the Supreme Court as their path to achieving their goals. Um, let's take a recent one homosexual marriage, so-called. That overturned the laws and constitutions of 31 states, including California. California put that in their constitution the same year they re-elected uh, President Obama. Same electorate. 
And yet the Supreme Court, with no basis, made its most radical ruling in its history in the Oberfeld decision to throw out 3,000 years of human history and all of our history of law in this country to forcibly legalize so-called gay marriage. They had never dealt with marriage before. And I, I say it's the most radical decision in their history uh, because, uh, as we'll mention, I was an engineer. I'm a numbers person. I tell people I was an engineer before I went to the dark side and went to law school. But uh, I'm a numbers person. The Supreme Court had previously ruled on the legal question in Oberfeld. That question was, does the 14th Amendment allow states to uh, treat marriage as between one man and one woman? And in 1974, the same court that gave us Roe v. Wade by a 7-2 vote said by a 9-0 vote that the, federal, that the Supreme Court didn't have subject matter jurisdiction. Now, to take you to law school real briefly, what that means is the Supreme Court said, we have no authority to decide this. And what that further means is that the Constitution the United States Constitution, doesn't grant any rights over and above what states do to redefine marriage. A 9-0 ruling, Baker v. Carr, I'm sorry, v. Nelson. Same court as the Roe v. Wade ruling, 9-0. And then in 2015, Oberfeld flipped it 5-4 the other way. With no change in law, and no change in the Constitution. They're, on average, very rough average, the Supreme Court reverses its previous rulings about one a year. Now normally, they're very minor things. This was not a very minor thing. And it is literally the only ruling, 9-0 ruling of the Supreme Court ever flipped without any change in the law or constitution. It is the only ruling in history like that. The only one. That's why I call it the most radical decision in the history of the Supreme Court. That's a numerical analysis is where my comment comes from. And of course the swing vote on that was Justice Kennedy. And um, and in some ways, it wasn't a surprise after his history of rulings. But that seat is now open and is likely to be filled by judge, hopefully soon to be Justice Kavanaugh. And it is, that case is so near in time that it wouldn't surprise me at all to see a follow-up case show up and what was the dissent, now with one more vote, with Judge Kavanaugh, become the majority? And Oberfell get flipped. And that might happen by, for instance, a polygamy case. If men can marry men, why can't I marry two men? Why one? Etc. You all know that, that the logic of gay marriage is unbounded. So as the boundary gets pushed, more cases can come up. And each of those cases will offer an opportunity to revisit Oberfeld. And I am personally hopeful that that will get reversed in the not too distant future, by which I mean maybe the next five years. Um, there'll be all kinds of firestorms, and the result will be that the, the question of what is a marriage will be sent back to where it has always belonged, and that's in the states. And now let's look at what that means for the life issue. Roe v. Wade has been the law so long now, 45 years, that 
people hardly even remember what was going on before it. And Roe v. Wade, the only thing Roe v. Wade did, it did two things. One is it forbade the banning by states of, a, of abortion uh, extensively. So if you were in a state that a, abortion was illegal in 1972, Roe v. Wade made it legal in 1973 by force. If you were in a state, I think New York is an example, where abortion was legal in 1972, it was still legal after Roe v. Wade. So this was a one-way ruling. It forced open the door of abortion in states that had not allowed abortion or had limited it. So if we reverse that, if Roe v. Wade ever gets reversed, abortion won't suddenly be illegal. What will happen is the federal government will be out of the business of addressing abortion. And it will, like marriage, be sent back to the 50 states. And we will have 50 separate political battles over where abortion lands in this country. Which is actually the way the founders, now, the founders wouldn't have envisioned us debating marriage or abortion, um, either of them. They would have presumed them both, they'd have laughed about the marriage question. Um, and um, they'd have scratched their heads on abortion. Nonetheless, Issues that aren't addressed in the Constitution like this were intentionally left to the states. So we can have our 50 state battles. So will we get there? Let's assume that Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed by the Senate. He's on track to be confirmed. The reading the tea leaves at the moment suggests he'll be confirmed. Nothing in his... I mean, does anybody in here remember an answer he gave to any substantive question? Yeah, it wasn't covered. There were too many arrests going on. Um, I remember one of the funny outfits one of the people arrested was wearing, but I don't remember many of the substantive answers that Judge Kavanaugh gave. And the reality is Judge Kavanaugh is sitting right now on the uh, Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. This is considered the most important of all of the federal courts of appeals. It is referred to in the legal profession as the mini Supreme Court. And the reason is because they get more significant legal questions of truly national significance than any other court of appeals because it's in Washington, DC. A lot of agency law, a lot of things like that. Um, and um, Judge Kavanaugh has written over 300 opinions. Anybody who really wants to know his legal thinking, it's not hidden, if you're willing to read 300 legal opinions, <laughs> rulings. And he has an impressive record of actually having his legal reasoning adopted by the Supreme Court. You compare that to another justice on the Supreme Court, the, the Justice Sotomayor, whose most notable achievement, she came from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, New York uh, area, was that she was reversed 80% of the time. That's really quite an accomplishment to head on up to the Supreme Court. Well, it was an F minus, so we'll promote you. Um, and yet that's what happened. And um, Judge Kavanaugh has a... Uh, has a long track record of success as a judge as judges measure it. Not as I would like to see it or others. I don't agree with his legal jurisprudence in every area. Fourth Amendment is my most noticeable departure for him, which is search and seizure law. Um, but, uh, but he's been very consistent in how he has approached things. And that's really what's got the left worried is that same limited constitutionalist approach, le the key word there being limited, you might think constitutionalist, but one leads to the other. Um, that limited approach 
is completely the opposite of what all these people getting arrested want. They want an activist Supreme Court to do their ideological will. And Judge Kavanaugh has given no indication in his 12 years on the bench or in his rather interesting few days in Senate hearings um, that he would be that kind of a judge or justice in this case. Um, with the Senate and the state it's in, with no filibuster, and I'll touch on that in a moment, it does appear that he will be confirmed. So part of the reason he'll be confirmed, even though this is, could be, could be, we'll know, it'll take a few years to really know, but this could be a substantial shift in the Supreme Court. And the reason it's possible for him to be confirmed in a 51-49 Senate is because the Democrats, back when they had control of the Senate, got rid of the filibuster, which is a 60-vote supermajority requirement for the confirmation of judicial nominees. Now, when they rewrote that rule, they did it for one year, and they did it for all the courts below the Supreme Court. And uh, the Republicans at this time said, don't do this, don't do this, you'll regret it. And, but their ideological left was pushing them very hard, and they caved into it. So then fast forward, and one of the most interesting aspects of the 2016 presidential election was that you didn't just get a president, you got a Supreme Court justice. And we all knew it. We all knew it. And um, <laughs> by Republican standards, I'll just say that President Trump was one of the Mm. He's not a pastor, and no one's going to mistake him for one, <laughs> right? And yet he got the highest percentage of the Catholic and evangelical vote of anyone running, I believe, in my lifetime, which is pretty extraordinary, given his decidedly non-pastor-like you know, approach more or less from the moment he wakes up. Uh, gets right on Twitter, right, you know. Um, but that category of voters, which includes me, cares more about judges long-term than any other issue. Sometimes short-term things pop up that, we, that catch our attention and we care a lot about, but n there is no issue so durable as a priority for a block of voters as judges and justices is for that block of voters. That's why Donald Trump got those votes and became President Trump. And to his credit, he has been extremely consistent in the quality and the nature of his judicial nominees for circuit court and the Supreme Court. There are some lapses among district court nominees where he's making deals with senators but, um, but by and large, you're getting this limited government constitutionalist approach. And the ones we all know about are, are now Justice Gorsuch, the first Supreme Court justice confirmed without a filibuster to stand in the way or be part of the discussion. And the Republicans got rid of it then, and the Democrats uh, made a lot of noise about it. But that was to fill Justice Scalia's seat. By any measure, uh, a, a, an absolute giant um, in judicial history. But it didn't really move the court a whole lot. And in fact, you may be surprised to know, this is just Ken's two cents, Justice Gorsuch, uh, again, time will tell, Justice Gorsuch may prove to be more conservative than Justice Scalia. And the main area and the main reason for that is his administrative law views which I might be able to put you to sleep with, but, but these are, you know, what kind of power does the EPA have and all these agencies? Justice Scalia gave these agencies deference. Justice Gorsuch does not. Again, even more limited. He doesn't give these agencies power. He limits their power. And um, Justice Kavanaugh, see, I'm already optimistic, um, is of a similar vein in that area. Um, 
Justice Thomas is already similar on the court. So you're actually developing a block of justices who want to limit this agency power for the first time. It's just done nothing but expand since the New Deal. Again, limited government. And when you think about Roe v. Wade and the, and the pro-life movement, which we associate at the judicial level with Roe v. Wade, um, that was a massive expansion of federal government. Massive. It literally had the federal courts invading all of the states and telling them what they could and couldn't do. Massive expansion of federal power and of the power of the court. And we've seen since then in our politics that that invasion of state authority drove abortion as an issue to be politicized between the parties. In the 70s, <clears throat> you could regularly find pro-life Democrats and, and pro-choice, as they called themselves, Republicans. It wasn't a dividing issue until the abortion issue took hold. And it was Catholics, frankly, first. You go back to the March for Life, it was Catholics that started the March for Life. And it's, it's one, of the, uh, one of the areas I work with many evangelical friends and allies in the political arena, and, and they acknowledge that uh, we really carried the ball for the first decade or so. Um, Ronald Reagan really awoke, and awoke the you know, Christian perspective on conservatism and, and inspired its organization, which really brought in a lot more allies into the life movement. And it's, since then, it's never gone back you will. And you can say that's a bad trend in politics or a good one, um, but the prioritization of life, in my view, is a good thing. The way it played out in politiza politicization may not have been so great, but it was important to prioritize this issue that the court had essentially taken from all the 50 states, or taken in large measure. If Judge Kavanaugh becomes Justice Kavanaugh, and if some of uh, the cases percolating around the country start to work their way up, what will you see? Well, I do not think that you will see a flat out overruling of Roe v. Wade. Um, the way I describe the court if Justice Kavanaugh or Judge Kavanaugh becomes Justice Kavanaugh is there are four hardcore liberals on the court there are three conservatives, and there will be two Justice Robertses. <laughs> um, I, when I look at Judge Kavanaugh, I see Justice Roberts. Um, and the reason I say that is, uh, first of all, as you can tell probably so far, I have a high opinion of Judge Kavanaugh as a judge, and I do. I want to make sure that's very clear to everyone. But he is by no means perfect. And he doesn't come from a cultural mold that I would pick. First of all, as a Gonzaga graduate, getting another Saint, uh, I'm sorry, Georgetown prep guy on the US Supreme Court, I don't know, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. But um, uh, Neil Gorsuch went there as well, um, which is amazing that one high school might end up with two Supreme Court justices, but that's what we may have. Um, Judge Kavanaugh went to Yale, he's a double Yaley. Um, and no offense to those who went to the Ivy League, I hold that against him. And I, I'm not joking about that. Um, I actually do not want to see more Ivy League people on the court. If you go back to Obamacare and think about Justice Roberts' ruling on Obamacare, it was a terrible ruling. Um, there was no legal explanation for his tax ruling, which is how he upheld Obamacare. He just crumbled. And I, I, the only explanation is he, as Chief Justice, had this desperate desire to uh, care for the image of others of the court. And that became his priority over the law. And that attitude is a very elitist attitude. After his stint in Yale, uh, Judge Kavanaugh um, worked inside the Beltway and never worked anywhere else. 
including the Bush White House. And um, while I've never met anyone in the Bush family who wasn't exquisitely nice, um, I also haven't met anyone in close in the Bush inner circle who is the person who is going to be, when the chips are down, they're going to they're gonna fight Xerxes at the pass and be one of the 300 Greeks. I just have never seen it. I've never seen it. And I don't think Judge Kavanaugh is that person. He may be. Funny thing about these life appointments, once they're there, they can be whoever they want to be at that point. They, they're not going to be removed. So there is some speculation, but I'm telling you why I think the way I do and why I think we're getting a second Justice Roberts and not another Neil Gorsuch. Um, Justice Roberts was willing to uh, err on the side of political correctness um, in occasional cases to the detriment of the law. I do think, even with that, you will see states given more leeway to address abortion as they see fit than has existed for a long, long time. Now, we're here in Virginia. Virginia's General Assembly is 51-49 split in the House and 21-19 in the Senate. Uh, of course, we have Democrat governor and Governor Northam. Uh, we, all the seats are up next year in 2019. And um, 2017 for Republicans was a disaster. They lost 16 seats in the House of Delegates. Extraordinary amount. Um, uh, 15, sorry. They held on to that 16th by the equivalent of a coin toss. Literally. Pulling a name out of a bowl. And... Um, and, and so the overturning of Roe v. Wade, viewed through the lens of what's legally possible in Virginia, doesn't change a whole lot. It doesn't change a whole lot, at least not in the near term. What will change is that people who address state politics will know that they are now truly addressing the root of the question of abortion in Virginia. And I've had supporters who know how pro-life I am who have said, Ken, uh, when, when abortion comes to Virginia, I'm not supporting you anymore. <laughs> Meaning the issue, if Roe v. Wade is overturned because it's a big deal to them and they're pro-choice. I said, well, you know where I stand. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll take your support for now. <laughs> and we'll talk later. Um, but uh, people will change their behavior, their voting behavior, their donating behavior. Um, and you'll see some gradual shifts in how campaigns are run. And I do think we're going to see that in the next five or ten years because I do think we're going to see Roe v. Wade and its follow-on cases chipped away. And the reason they're going to be chipped away is because they were decided wrong legally. They're just bad legal decisions. Whatever. Set aside what you think of abortion. If you want the law to be correct, they got the law wrong. They got the law wrong. Um, you, sometimes you, your non-lawyers in particular will hear occasionally people joking about penumbras and emanations and so forth. That's only a joke because it's funny. It was actually what they were talking about in the ruling. Penumbras and emanations from various aspects of the Constitution, um, which they called ultimately a constitutional right of privacy. Now, there is, there are two amendments to the Constitution that do provide a right of privacy. The famous Third Amendment, uh, which means that the federal government can't quarter troops in your house. Not very controversial, never invoked. But it is technically a right of privacy. It keeps the government out of your house. The more common one is the Fourth Amendment, related to search and seizure, I mentioned earlier. That is specifically to define what it takes for the government to invade your property or to seize you physically. 
That is, I would call that a right of privacy. The Tenth Amendment says everything else is left to the states. And while we may not appreciate that, there, my understanding of Justice Thomas's view is that we now know life begins at conception, and so life should be protected from the moment of conception. Justice Scalia's view, as I understand it, was that um, this was an area uh, unsettled at the time the Constitution was ratified, and so it should be left to the states. Um, as a constitutional matter, I tend to agree with Scalia, even though that actually moves me a little away from the uh, absolute protection of life position, but that's what our Constitution says. I want life protected, but um, let's at least understand the parameters. One thing that happens a lot that I learned when I was litigating the Obamacare case, I was the first Attorney General to sue on Obamacare, and um, I'd go up and tell um, congressmen what was going on in the case, because I was the only Republican Attorney General for about 500 miles from Washington, D.C., literally, um, and I never moved to Richmond, um, when I became AG, I stayed up here. So I was actually local. And I'd get up there and tell them what was going on. And I remember I went up uh, in May of 2012, after the oral argument, before the ruling in June of 2012. And they were doing some medical malpractice reform at the federal level. Sounds great, right? Oh, medical malpractice reform. We're here talking about OBGYNs and healthcare. So it sounds great, right? Wrong. Wrong. Wrong at the federal level. So we had Republicans who would scream about Obamacare being a violation of federalism, meaning invading the rights of the states, the prerogatives of the states, turn around and say, we want to pass a federal law that does, I kid you not, tells state judges, not federal judges, state judges, what they can rule in state medical malpractice cases. And they had no qualms about that. It didn't occur to them that they were beating total hypocrites. Yes. So, you know, it, it's, when you're telling an audience what they want to hear and you're fighting on the same side they're on, they like you. So I finished talking about this and I was talking to this healthcare caucus of congressmen and women and I said, hey, I can't leave without mentioning this other issue. Um, and I mentioned the medical malpractice reform. And I just want you all to know that if you pass this in this form, and I rattled off a few things in the bill, um, I will sue you faster than I sued the president and will kick your butt. <laughs> and I went from the most popular guy in the room to the least popular in about four sentences. And, um, but... I pointed out to them, you know, I thought you all were for federalism. And what happens in Washington is they're for federalism when it defeats the issue they want to defeat. As you've discovered with President Trump, all of a sudden a bunch of Democrat attorneys general have discovered federalism. Now their version of federalism is very interesting. They sue the federal government for stopping doing things to states. When I was an attorney general and was suing the federal government, it was because they were doing things to states that they didn't have the power to do. Um, so, and that used to be bipartisan, by the way. All AGs used to just defend the prerogatives of states. It wasn't a party thing. It became a party thing in the last 15 years or so. Um, so as we go forward, you have that dynamic playing out as well. This is what it's doing to our politics. But in the Supreme Court, with five lifetime appointments, if you count the Chief Justice Roberts, probable Justice Kavanaugh, newest Justice Gorsuch, still has that new justice smell, um, Justice Thomas and Justice Alito um, are likely as a block where the other four are absolutely definitely be opposed to allow states more leeway to regulate abortion and the surroundings of abortion, for instance, medical licensing and other things as it relates to abortion, than we've seen before. I think that's what you're likely to see 
in this arena going forward. And, um, and it's been a long time coming, frankly. Uh, in a state like Virginia, I don't know that we're gonna see much change, but you will in other states. You will in other states. It will be rather dramatic changes in some other states. Basically the middle flyover country, as it's called, um, uh, since Sarah Palin days. Um, it, that, you could see a significant shift in the direction of more pro-life. You won't see things get particularly more pro-abortion in other states because they can already do that. And whatever they were going to do in that direction, they have done. Now, some of them will have sort of political temper tantrums and go do more because they want to be seen doing more. And, I, and, and that's not a joke. Political people want potential supporters to see them looking busy. I remember Father Fasano told a, told a joke once. No, really. Um, and uh, it was... Uh, you know, what do you do if Jesus shows up? Look a busy. And, uh, and um, you know, for politicos, they want to look busy. Look how hard I'm fighting. Look at this mean letter I wrote to the EPA, to use a Virginia congressman example, as if that does anything. But it works. People fall for it all the time. Looking like you're fighting, and one way to look like you're fighting is pass more legislation, even if it takes you out into la-la land, um, and so we will see some of that that will be part of the pushback. Now, in the event that um, President Trump got another appointment to the Supreme Court, uh, the last list of four judges, uh, of course, included Judge Kavanaugh. It also inc included um, new Judge Amy Barrett, former Notre Dame law professor. She's now on the Seventh Circuit, has been there since last December. She was my preferred first choice. Uh, Judge Hardiman in the Third Circuit and Judge Kethridge in the uh, Sixth Circuit. In my view, and realizing there's no absolute answer key to this, all of them, in my view, are what you would think of in the traditional description of conservative. Um, I'm, a, I'm legally much more libertarian, um, or, or Madisonian liberal is actually, that would be James Madison, was really where I land. And, and they are more in that direction than Kavanaugh. And um, so if there are more appointments, assuming that President Trump stays on the track he's been on, then I think um, going from 5-4 to 6-3 could actually start to create some downhill momentum toward more uh, rapid uh, reversal, really undoing, not new law, just undoing the courts taking over areas of law and giving them back to the states and limiting the federal government, especially agency power. And uh, that could have dramatic impacts on, for pro-lifers, for, for the whole pro-family movement. And uh, where a lot of this is fought out now, on the front of religious liberty. Um, one thing I should say, it's always been a bit of a frustration as a Catholic. Uh, our, our bishops, for, year, for my whole life, have just lobbied for more and bigger government, more and bigger government, more and bigger government, no borders, you know, the whole nine yards. And you don't, you don't uh, however you may feel about all of those things, again, isn't my, my point here. It is that with more and bigger government comes more government power. Um, I describe it as the liberty pie. You've all heard the economic pie. Um, the economic pie grows and shrinks depending on taxes. If taxes go down, the economy can grow. It can actually get bigger, creating more overall wealth. And it can get smaller if government does dumb things or if there's trade wars or whatever. Um, but the liberty pie never changes size. And it has two slices, government power, and citizens' liberty. And every single thing government does to uh, expand its power comes directly at the expense of our freedom, our liberty. Everything. No exceptions. It's a zero-sum game. Higher taxes, less freedom. 
Government takes that money from you, they decide how to spend it. Government regulation, they dictate how you run your business, live your life, etc. That's an easy one. The hardest one is the third one. More government spending means less liberty for you, means less freedom. They crowd you out. And they direct more of what's going on in our world here in America by doing that. And by the way, they bury our children in debt, but that's another matter. Um, government takes that power from us and assumes it to itself. And the reason, now you will hear, and I hear it where I go to church all the time, prayers for religious liberty, especially the right of the church to practice, to preach, and so forth. All true, arguably the highest priority among our rights. But what isn't connected in the oldest philosophical organization in the world, the Catholic Church, is that the bigger we have grown that government, the more absolutely certain we have made it that it will take away our religious liberty. Obamacare denies religious liberty. It's one of the results of it. It is inevitable. If you fully implement Obamacare, you will reduce religious liberty. In fact, it is designed to do that. So if you want more government in area A, B, C, D, and E, but you don't want it in area F, well, I got news for you. Once A, B, C, D, and E are all grown, they're going to crowd F right on out. And right now that's religious liberty, and it's a center point of battle right now. Um, Judge Kavanaugh has a track record in this area that lands on the side of religious liberty versus the state. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, and those battles lie ahead. They really haven't been addressed. The Supreme Court has made some rulings where they've really delayed the full debate on those questions to the future. And Judge Kavanaugh is going to be in the middle of those debates. So that's, that's our prospects looking forward. I think it's positive. Is it like fireworks positive? We're going to solve all our legal, political problems positive? No. Is it going to solve the challenge of the, the culture of death in our society? No. This does that. That's why I started with it. I mean, in our community, we, by our support and by what we do, affect the debate over life in people's lives. But here we've looked a little bit at how this has moved and how it's moving in the political and legal arena and judge, soon to be Justice Kavanaugh, I think, how he's gonna affect it and how I think we can see changes going in the future. Um, so I'm optimistic in that regard and I am not a naturally optimistic person. So that's, uh, you know, that I'm, it's not like a 50-50 call if Cuccinelli is gonna be optimistic about something. So it, it takes a little bit of evidence to get me past the uh, point where I'd be willing to say I'm actually optimistic about the direction this is going, but I am. I'm positive, I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, and I also see the opportunities, frankly, where our church and many of its institutions, uh, Little Sisters of the Poor, were in one of these big lawsuits in the last few years, um, nuns being ordered to pay for contraception. <laughs> uh, there's a good plaintiff. Um, but, uh, you know, th those sorts of ridiculous things, they, they seem ridiculous to us, but they are the natural occurrence of the growth of government, the growth of socialism, which is the direction we've been heading for so long. It is a natural part of socialism, as it has to crush all these other freedoms to be able to implement its plan. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions and you can give me the hook from the back when you want to cut my time, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions on these or any associated areas. Yes, ma'am. Can you explain to us what happened um, in California? The voters voted down gay marriage twice. Yeah. They voted down gay marriage twice, so the question was uh, explaining how a gay marriage was voted down in California and then suddenly was upon them. Um, California is where the 
where the, if I remember correctly, where the Oberfeld case came out of, the Northern District of California. California voters voted, I want to say 52% to uh, preserve marriage as it had always been between one man and one woman. And it was challenged in federal court in California. All, and no one in California government would defend it, even though it was the law. It was a very odd situation. Um, look, when I was the attorney general, I had to defend things I didn't like. Um, when, you, when you take on that role, your client is the government, and you take the good stuff and the bad stuff. Uh, in my view, uh, not doing so is essentially unethical. Well, they don't apparently have ethics in California, um, or at least none that they will apply in the face of an outcome they want. And uh, so there was no one to defend the law. So the coalition that had run the ballot effort stepped forward to defend it, and, and that whole debate about whether they had the right to even defend it was uh, part of the case. And um, it was not handled well by the, by the district court judge. It was really butchered very thoroughly. And the courts out there in the West, the West Coast, Arizona, Hawaii, Alaska, are in the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. Lawyers refer to it as the nutty ninth because it is continually the most reversed court of appeals out there and it's just unabashedly um, liberal activist. And sure enough, they delivered up this case. Um, the Supreme Court took it. There were conflicts developing around the country, which is normally when the Supreme Court will take a case. They will not normally take the first case up on a subject. Normally, they'll take a case up when one circuit decides one way and another circuit, say the Fourth Circuit, where we live here, Virginia, the Carolinas, West Virginia, and Maryland, decides another way. Then the Supreme Court, because you only have one constitution, it can only have one meaning. Very Catholic, isn't it? Um, but uh, uh, they want to resolve that conflict, so that's normally how they'll take a case. That's how Oberfeld went up. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth in California about how they were going to defend the case, and you had state officials who just wouldn't defend it, um, which was appalling and unprecedented, um, but kind of consistent with how they've behaved. So, yes, sir, front. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I thought one of the most interesting parts, for me at least, was when you said that Obamacare was designed to infringe on religious liberty. Yeah. Was this one of President Obama's objectives from the beginning? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they understand that these principles and institutions stand in the way of the direction they want to go, um, the historical march of history, right? Where have you read that? Um, a little thing called the Manifesto of the Communist Variety. And um, it, it applies to socialism as well. I mean, it's just a different degree of the same thing. and. Uh, religious liberty and religious institutions stand in the way of these agendas. It's why, it's part of why they were the plaintiffs in so many of these suits. Um, because uh, we have immutable principles that we don't believe are debatable, right? Um, it doesn't mean other people can't do other things, but if you're going to try to enforce a law against us in violation of those principles, principles that are protected by the Constitution, we have a basis to fight back. And that's what happened. Um, so yes, it, that was part of the overall design. Um, you're now hearing former President Obama support um, you know, so-called Medicare for All, which is really just single-payer health care. Uh, many of us believe that was always their goal. Obamacare was just an intermediate step. Um, and um, uh, I know we have some veterans in here. Uh, if you want an example of uh, a, a great one side, you know, Medicare for all, one single payer health care. Look at the veterans' health care system. Um, it's, it's a disaster, and it is the future of Obamacare. Um, and uh, one of the other things Obamacare does is turn health care into a commodity. Um, it makes one thing as good as another, and it takes the doctors and the nurses and the actual met provision of medical care, it subjugates that to the regulations and the paperwork. Um, one of the undiscussed aspects of Obamacare 
is we've talked about the religious liberty element. I mentioned the anti-life pieces and the course contraception elements. Um, but it's driving people away from the medical profession. If you talk to doctors, if you go back a generation, well over half of doctors would urge a child or children into the medical field. Now you will find way below half of them urge their children in this direction because the reasons they went into medicine are not achievable in the ordinary course of the profession any longer. And, um, and that's unfortunate. I mean, when I went to law school, all the med school students could get into law school. Not all the law school students could get into med school. And that is reversing. And it's reversing because many of our best and brightest are so turned off by what government has done to health care that it is not attractive to them to give up 10 years of their life for education and to go into massive debt, to then go into what amounts to a, a, you know, a human processing factory line instead of the practice of medicine. Um, it's really, a, it's a major unaddressed problem. Yeah, Bob. Yeah. Uh, back to this overflow decision, the argument that I keep hearing on the radio and in the press and whatnot is that well, there's so many thousands of same-sex couples that are already married and I presume uh, adopted children and all of that sort of thing, uh, that it's too late. Uh, I know you don't think it's too late, but how does that, how does that factor in? Argument, uh, uh, how is that treated uh, in, the, in the court? In the so the question was, um, how is an argument along the lines, let's say Oberfeld, the, the, the gay marriage decision, is re-argued. How is the argument that, oh, there's thousands, tens of thousands of, of these married couples now all across the country, including in these 31 states where it's really at issue, um, how does that affect the legal decision making? And the answer is, um, it's not measurable, but it does affect it. Um, part of the, the, it's usually thought of as an equitable argument um, that rights have vested, um, people have adjusted their lives and expectations based on how the law was interpreted in 2015, and part of the impediment of reversing it is undoing all of those expectations now that we all live with in this country. And um, so I think if that were to happen, the way it would be handled is those people wouldn't be affected. They'd effectively, as odd as it is, and there's no real constitutional basis for this, is that they would, the, the Supreme Court would leave them as they were, or are at the time of the ruling, and, um, if, and revert back to allowing the states to decide this stuff otherwise as it was before going forward. So I think the folks uh, who have taken advantage of this opportunity since the Oberfell ruling would be left intact and that it would be turned back over to the states going forward. Um, but it does affect the argument. And what I tell young lawyers is, we're all taught in law school the burden of proof. You've all heard it on television in a criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, right? And yeah, whatever that means. Um, preponderance of the evidence in a civil case, more likely than not. But what I tell young lawyers is, what people forget is that human beings have to decide whether the burden of proof is met. I call that the burden of persuasion. You have to convince a human being, or 12 human beings, depending on the circumstances, that you have met that burden of proof. And part of persuasion is emotional. It is right-brained, which leaves me at a distinct disadvantage, <laughs> being an engineer. and. Um, but I know it's there and I know I have to address it, and that's the reality of a case. So oftentimes, uh, for instance, as a, as a lawyer in a case, and I'll use a, a relatively recent example, when I've got a lawyer on the other side really beating up my client, and this is a tightrope I have to walk, um, sometimes I'll just let them do it because they look like a complete ass. And, you know, in a case that's about, say, abuse, well, you're making my case for me. You're violating the first rule of holes. When you're in one, stop digging. 
And lawyers who've practiced for decades do this. Politicos do this. You see them, I mean, you, you can see how they ask questions. I mean, I'll use the Kavanaugh situation. There were Democrat senators on the dais in the Kavanaugh hearing introducing people in the crowd who were part of the groups being arrested. You have tied yourself to that tactic. And they think that's okay. In fact, uh, where I cannot think of another nominee for whom public attention to his or her hearings made them more likely to be confirmed rather than less. I actually think in this situation, the behavior was so outrageous, it made it more likely, not less, that Kavanaugh would be confirmed. Uh, it, it's a pretty tough situation. Yeah, Kimberly. For the liberal justices, mm -hmm. from your awareness of their rulings, have you seen anything that would make you think any of them would be willing to protect religious liberty in any area of consciousness? So the question was, uh, among the four liberal justices, is there anything that I've seen that leads me to think any of them might protect religious liberty under various circumstances? And the short answer is yes, but it's very unpredictable. You know, when it shows up, you're like, oh, well, that's kind of a nice treat today, you know? Um, but you, when, you, when you plan a case for the Supreme Court, you don't just write a brief. You write a brief for nine people. And what you put in that brief is literally, I mean, you're thinking about justice by justice. And the, the four liberal justices, there's no consistent trend among any of the four that gives me anything to aim at in this area. I can hope, but you know, hope is a, uh, Francis Bacon said, hope is a fine breakfast, but a lousy supper. It's a great place to start, but it's not much to rely on. Um, and um, they really haven't, when, when they've come along, it's been rare, or it's been an overwhelming case where you have such extreme facts. Like the California, I'm sorry, Colorado uh, baker, the baker, yeah. baker case. I'm, I'm seeing breaking into baker cake. In um, uh, baker case. Um, you had their civil, so-called civil rights commission, that was openly castigating the faith of the baker mm -hmm. and saying, you know, you you cannot have this faith. It is inimical to you know, our state policies. Well, um, that made it pretty easy at the Supreme Court level. And um, it was a rough place to be as the Solicitor General for Colorado having to try to defend that. Um, and um, that's when you actually want your time to run out as the lawyer, you know? Um, and, um, and they really, it isn't that they did bad lawyering. What do you do? with that. There just wasn't much to do. And even some of the liberal justices uh, spoke in condemnatory terms. But when I read that, what I see a liberal justice doing is broadcasting to all the rest of the authorities out there, don't do this anymore, and we got you. That's what I see happening. Yes, sir. Yep, I remember. Um, so one of the, pr the legal ideas that Roe versus Wade relied on, and which traces its history to such esteemed cases like Dred Scott, I'm being ironic, um, yeah. was substantive due process. Yep. Even for a student, let alone a lawyer, that's a really bizarre concept. Can you talk about that idea a little bit? Um, this is definitely in the weeds for lawyers, but what I will say is um, uh, you know, the, the easiest way for you all to think about due process is uh, the 14th Amendment. Um, after the Civil War uh, gave cert protected certain rights. Obviously, the 13th Amendment ended slavery. 14th Amendment began to make it real for black citizens. And um, what has arisen out of those due process cases is something called substantive due process, as if it is somehow separate, as it confers some magical rights, unspecified, mind you, never named anywhere, except by judges, justices, 
who use it as they go along. It is literally a completely judge-fabricated thing. I won't even call it constitutional because it's not in the Constitution. The words due process are. Um, and there are due process rights, which is usually the, the right to notice and to be heard. So I should have noticed that I'm going to be charged with a crime and I should have the opportunity to present evidence in my defense. Those are due process rights. Substantive due process is a mythical argument that has existed in the judicial arena for decades, really more than 100 years, um, that, uh, that judges use to essentially create rights. And um, uh, it's, it's hard to explain because it doesn't have any real roots. It is made up by the judiciary. And um, the only place to learn about it and understand it is via case law, because that's where it began. It didn't begin in the Constitution. It didn't begin in our laws. It began with judges just deciding. Um, you, the more mo modern examples are, um, you may have heard phrases like evolving notions of liberty. Since Justice Kennedy is retiring, uh, Justice O'Connor was famous on that one as well. These evolving notions of liberty. Well, if, if you sign a contract for 40 years, and there's a fight over it in the 39th year, guess what? It still means the same thing as the day you signed it. Well, the Constitution is a contract. But evolving notions of liberty is an explanation by people who don't have an appeal above them in their legal system, Supreme Court justices, that they use as an excuse to change the meaning of that contract we call the Constitution from year zero. That's what those phrases are about. Um, it began in the actual progressive era. Um, people now call themselves progressive. They're trying not to be called liberal or socialist because that's bad branding. But actual progressives went through the legal process, um, gave us some bad things, but they did it through the, the existing legal processes. Then it began to be judges who were doing it, not going through any legal process, just waving their judge wand and giving us these things. And I'm sorry I can't be more specific than that, but that's the nature of the beast of substantive due process, is it's really just been brought into being, it's evolved out of nothing. Um, and it's been a, a uh, conjured up by activist judges through the years. Um, and then there are other justices, like Justice Scalia, one of his notable traits is that even errors that existed for a long time, the fact they existed a long time gave them force and effect to Justice Scalia. Justice Thomas, again, doesn't agree with this. This is enshrining mistakes in the Constitution and by judicial philosophy. And I, I don't think he got that exactly right. Um, but there are people that you hear this phrased in Judge Kavanaugh's discussion as stare decisis. Um, even if we got it wrong, uh, after a long enough time, it should just not be disturbed. There's, you know, how long? I don't know. Nobody really knows. Um, because it's this, it's whatever's convenient for a majority of judges in a particular case. So, yes, sir. Yes. <coughs> Elizabeth Yore, spelled Y-O-R-E, is a journalist interested in sex trafficking. She went to a meeting that she thought was about sex trafficking. It wasn't. It was about socialism. President at the meeting was Obama, your um, Soros, the United Nations, and Pope Francis. Pope Francis has plenty to deal with these days. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> um, but I mean, w one of the challenges, in my view, uh, for the Pope is that he came of age and uh, even progressed through the church hierarchy in a country where. Um, of freedom and free markets, his notion of what an economy is was warped by Argentina. And a small group of powerful families controlled it. And when we talk about free markets, he, he, that's what he, I think, sees is this cronyist controlled system, which is wrong, morally wrong. And um, 
you know, if you dress up socialism, I, I can make it sound pretty good. The problem is it can't work without crushing various liberties and more and more of them over time. And a lot of candidly people in our church, including the hierarchy, are, are very naive about that. Um, one of the things I joke about pro-lifers about is we're too nice. We believe people. Oh, I'm pro-life. Oh, that's great. You're pro-life. They're lying. They're lying. <laughs> that should be your starting assumption, that they're lying. I don't mean the Pope, but, but, um, <laughs> but in the political arena. But, um, you know, we believe this stuff. Our bishops believe this stuff. And they're just bought off too easily, by argument, I mean. And um, with terrible, terribly detrimental effects. It's, it's counter to, you know, Christian instincts, but we've got to be realistic. Um, and we've got, to, we've got to fight and live in this world, and, and we don't always do that very effectively. So, yes, ma'am. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I'll start with the second one because I think it's easier. I think the answer is yes. Um, but to your sort of follow-on point on that, is it does sort of get subsumed in the in the partisan lineup. There are people. Um, in fact, most voters, abortion as an issue is not a priority for them. There are people who are pro-life for whom it is a priority, and there are people who uh, cast themselves as pro-choice for whom it is a priority. But it is just an issue of varying degrees of importance to, to, the, to most other voters. Um, and it does, it has broken down now so much by party that party labels have become a proxy. Um, if you tell me you're a running for office as a Democrat today, I know you are very pro-abortion. And, and I use the phrase pro-abortion because it includes taxpayer funding and other things. You're not just willing to step back and let people make choices, you're trying to fund a particular direction. And at that point, you've gone beyond choice and you're going to pro-abortion. And the party labels kind of identify that now. So I do think it gets subsumed. Your question about Trump and limited government is a e really excellent question. He never ran, interestingly, and know my background. I worked with Ted Cruz's presidential campaign. Um, I ran his convention operations. Um, so when you saw President, then Donald Trump, having temper tantrums because he won a state and then we won the delegates, I did that. So, <laughs> <laughs> a point he reminded me of the first time I was ever in the Oval Office after he was in there. He, he practically yelled at me, you! You're the guy who kept taking those states from me. Yes, Mr. President, that was me. But um, he never ran as a conservative. He never ran as a limited government person. He did say, this is what I'm going to do on judges. He even put out a list, um, which I thought was a spectacular tactic. Um, and, I, and I don't use the word tactic to denigrate it. I, I want to know what I'm getting. I wish every candidate would tell me, who's going to be your Secretary of the Treasury? Who's going to be your Secretary of Defense? And in fact, two years before that campaign, almost two years, I was talking to the, to the Rand Paul folks, and I gave them only one suggestion, and it was this. It was, name your Secretary of State. Because if you all, you know, his father, Ron Paul, and he are both thought of in Republican circles as very isolationist, too isolationist. And, and Rand would say, no, 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 I'm not quite where my dad was, but he never really explained where he was. And personnel is policy. So tell us who's going to be implementing your policy. It would go a long way. Well, Trump did the equivalent with the judges. If I get elected, this is what you get. And remember, this is with an open seat on the Supreme Court. And so the, the level of transparency was unprecedented. That the Clinton campaign could go through all of the names on that list, and they did, and they could try to take shots at them, and they did. Uh, and it got no real traction, because they were all high-quality judges 
with, frankly, a worldview you'd expect from a Republican president. Um, he's been more consistent than most of his Republican predecessors. But what he has not done, except in the regulatory arena, is made any commitment to shrinking the power of government. Um, and, and which was one of the reasons I was with Ted Cruz, um, is uh, in the deregulation arena, the president has done that. It isn't because he's ever articulated a desire to limit the power of government. It's because he wants to limit regulation as a burden on the economy. It just so happens that expands all of our freedom, including economic opportunity. But there are other areas where um, uh, he's acted in the other direction. Um, so I would not say that he has an, any sort of ideological commitment to this. He is what I would, I refer to him frequently as a practicalist, and it, which really becomes an issue by issue thing that can be massively influenced by politics and, and pleasing the last person who he was in front of, um, which is difficult to predict sometimes. Um, and uh, so uh, sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. You know, he's complained about these massive budgets. Republicans, by the way, giving him huge budgets, and he doesn't veto them. He complains about them. Well, presidents have a way to complain. Veto. That's your complaint. And anything short of that, they're just going to keep on going. Um, so anyway, I... I really uh, appreciate being part of this evening and I appreciate being at this church that I've attended many times. Father, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, Will had started, and I see you all have Divine Mercy Care bags there. I would really urge you, for those of you who are not involved in their mission, to engage yourself in it. Whether you're a monthly donor or a volunteer, there are so many ways to be helpful in that area. And as much as I'm hopeful with Judge Kavanaugh likely coming onto the bench. Um, where we live and in the real world, it's going to be up to us one person at a time to really carry this message forward. And, um, and I would urge you to participate in, in doing exactly that. So thank you all very much. God bless you. And thank you all for being here.